And now, it is my great, great honor to introduce to you our speaker tonight. And I have to tell you, the more time I spend with him, now I feel I'm not letting him go back to Israel. But he is just an amazing guy, and we're really honored and delighted to have Mr. Levy with us. Gideon Levy, a journalist with Israeli newspaper Haaretz since 1982, has covered the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in particular, the occupation of Gaza and the West Bank for over 20 years. His perspective is one rarely heard in Canada, that of an Israeli still living in his homeland and subject to the dangers that concern all Israelis, yet unflinching in his criticism of Israel's conduct. The son of two Holocaust survivors, Levy was born in Tel Aviv and still makes his home there. He served in the Israeli army from 1974 to 1978, and he was an aide to Shimon Peres, then leader of the Israeli Labour Party, and now Israel's president, from 1978 to 1982. In 1982, he started writing for the Haaretz. The quality of his journalism and his contributions to human rights have been recognized both within Israel and overseas. He has been the recipient of the Euromed Journalist Prize in 2008, the Leipzig Freedom Prize 2001, the Israeli Journalist Union Prize in 1997, and the Association of Human Rights in Israel Award for 1996. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me and welcome Mr. Gideon Levy. such an evening could never have taken place in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem or in Israel. People wouldn't show up neither to discuss the Israeli occupation nor to listen to Gidon Levy. And would it be different, maybe we wouldn't have to meet here and we could have uh, talked about other issues. Before I get to my main uh, topic, I would like to add some more things about my personal background because I think it counts to understand what happens, what was happening to the Israeli society. I was brought up as a good boy in Tel Aviv, a typical production of the Israeli education system and media, brought up in a non-political home whatsoever. Uh, my uh, secrets were revealed already. I both served in the army, and what is much worse than this, I worked for Shimon Peres for four years. <laughs> and uh, it was only in the late 80s when I started to do something that most of the Israelis don't do. I started to travel to the West Bank and Gaza. And then I realized that the real drama of Israel is taking place in its backyard, in its very dark backyard. And I realized that there is almost no one to tell the story of what's happening in a distance of half an hour drive from our homes. And I realized that I have to take upon myself this mission, this ungrateful mission of trying to tell the Israelis the stories that they don't want to know, that they don't want to hear about, trying to write things that they don't want to read. There was only one benefit in this decision of mine to take this mission upon myself. And this was, I mean, those of you who know something about journalism will appreciate it. So many times I found myself exclusive which is the wet, wet dream of any journalist. <laughs> 
but I wish I was less exclusive in the Israeli society. Before I get to the topic itself, I first of all would like to thank from the bottom of my heart to the organizers, to Justice, to Canada for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, which uh, also surprised me again and again by their devotion, by their really uh, enthusiasm, which again you can hardly see in the Israeli society. For many years I was asking myself, how come that a society that sees itself as a democratic one and is in a way a democratic society, for sure for its Jewish citizens, how come that a society that sends rescue teams to any earthquake and floods all over the world, first field hospital in Haiti, Israel, a society which I guess part of you know Israel, they are not monsters, at least part of them. Young people with no with at least part of them, who would uh, help an old lady to cross the road many times even if she doesn't want to cross the road. <laughs> People with values. How come that when it comes to the backyard of our own home, half an hour away, all of a sudden new game, new rules. How come that uh, an occupation, and believe me there were longer occupations in history, more brutal occupations in history, but there was never an occupation, as far as I know, in which the occupier felt so good about himself, and what is even more sure than this, there was never in history an occupation where the occupier presented himself as a victim. This is unheard of. As the late Golda Meir, the unforgettable only man in the Israeli cabinet as they used to present her. As the late Golda Meir had once phrased it in this really unforgettable way, we will never forgive the Arabs for forcing us to kill their children. And that's the way of thinking. And I kept on asking myself, how come that the society feels so good about itself? You know, trying to tell an Israeli that the Israeli army is not the most moral army in the world. Many times I say, maybe we are the second moral army in the world, not the first one. <laughs> Let's say the army of Luxembourg is more moral and we are the second. No way they will be deeply offended. No way the Israeli army, the IDF, is the most moral army on earth. And the Israelis are deeply convinced that this is the case. So I kept on asking myself, how can a society lose connection with reality? Not wanting to know, not willing to know, feeling so good about itself, and in the same time, be responsible for crimes, for atrocities, for really a cruel and brutal occupation that I'm not sure that you need to get descriptions of how brutal and how cruel and how inhuman is this occupation. And it was once when I was standing in, the, in one of the checkpoints, in Kalandia checkpoint, few years ago before it became what it is today and I looked at the environment where the soldiers were standing and the crowds were waiting and I kept on asking myself oh, what's going on here there were hundreds and thousands of people Palestinian men women children waiting in the Sun or in the rain in dust in garbage surrounded by garbage no water, no toilet, no roof to protect them, nothing. And I asked myself, why is it so? Is it a problem of budget? And then it was really one moment of, uh, of, of revelation, I would say, when it came through my mind. 
the army or the government or the authorities are doing anything possible. That the soldier who stands in the checkpoint will not get any sense that he is dealing with human beings. It's not about the Palestinians, it's about the soldier. And ever since then I understood that the only explanation for this good feeling that we all carry Israelis about ourselves and the fact that this occupation can last for so long with so little moral doubts in the Israeli society, if at all, is possible only thanks to this dehumanizing, dehumanization process of the Palestinians, which enable us to feel good about ourselves, to say that we stand for human rights, but when it comes to the Palestinians, that's a new game. I once compared the conditions of such a checkpoint to a place where you transfer animals, and I got protest letters from animal rights organizations. <laughs> and speaking about animals, as far as it will sound to you ridiculous, Take my word, what I'm going to tell you now is pure truth. There were two dogs killed in cast-led operation. One dog was killed in a villa in Ashkelon, from a Kassam. The other dog was killed with the troops getting into Gaza. Both dogs, which were killed in two different days, got front page coverage in the Israeli media. Picture coverage of their funeral, interview with the owner, owners who told how wonderful they were, their names obviously, front page in the popular newspapers of Israel. In the very same day that those two dogs were killed, were killed tens of Palestinians. It appeared in the Israeli media. But where? In page 15, 16, 17, one small column, no headline, no names, no pictures, obviously. Many times, by the end of another story, and yesterday they were killed, 82 Palestinians in cast lead. And to the Israeli reader who reads newspaper systematically, who is trained to know that what is important appears on front page, and what is less important appears, like in any newspaper in the world, appears later on. The message was very clear. Two dogs, two Israeli dogs, are a story. Tens of Palestinians killed is less of a story. Or in other words, the life of two Israeli dogs are much more worse than life of tens of Palestinians who were killed in the very same day. When this is being done systematically over the years, day after day, this process of dehumanizing, we get the outcome of a society who feels moral, who feels good about itself and is responsible for this brutal occupation. Now when we speak about the occupation, one should remember that we are not speaking anymore about a temporary phenomenon. You know, people always ask about the one state solution. There is one state. The occupation is part and parcel of Israel. When an occupation lasts for 42 years and Israel existed without the occupation only for 19 years, you can't claim that this is temporary, that this is about to end, that this is not part of the state of Israel. So whenever we talk about the only democracy in the Middle East, Mobile Broadcast News.